What's up, everyone? It's Zav Dematos here with Ludwig Kietzman and Mike Schramm. Hey, how you guys doing? Hey, how's it going? Doing good. Great. Uh, and we have with us Jeff O'Connell from United Front Games, senior producer of the game we're about to play, which is Sleeping Dogs. How you doing, Jeff? Great. Thanks, Jeff. How are you? Great. Uh, and thanks for joining us and, and allowing us to play the game for people who are eager to, to see it. It's coming out uh, next week on August 14th. Uh, right. And uh, on PC, Xbox 360, and PlayStation 3. This is the PC version of the game I'm going to be playing with a controller, uh, just because it's going to be easier for me, and it's going to be better for people not to hear me clicking the keys like crazy. Uh, but before we start, can you uh, can can you let us know uh, a little bit about the narrative overview of the game? Sure. Uh, so Sleeping Dogs, as you said, uh, Square Enix, the yeah, front games. Uh, we're really, really happy to uh, bring this to everybody next week, August 14th. And the narrative overview is that you're playing Wei Shen, who's uh, an undercover police officer, uh, undercover with the triads uh, in Hong Kong. And uh, we've been inspired by Hong Kong cinema to make this game, uh, both Hong Kong action cinema that um, Western Western gamers would be familiar with from movies as far back as Bruce Lee and uh, Jackie Chan and Jet Li, all the way up through John Woo, and um, you know even uh, some stuff that Tony Jaa is doing now, and also not by um, just Hong Kong action cinema, but by Hong Kong um, dramas as well, Hong Kong undercover cop dramas uh, like the Tri Election series or the movie Infernal Affairs, which inspired The Departed. So we've drawn from um, so the best of Hong Kong uh, cinema and, and tried to to package it up and put it in a really engrossing uh, city that we fell in love with during our research there, which of course is Hong Kong, and uh, bring that to people with something you know, uh, fresh and new that they haven't seen before in terms of uh, a new city and uh, deeper action mechanics that they've um, seen before in an open world game, an urban open world game, and also um, being a cop, which is something that despite the fact that there are so many movies and uh, books, TV shows uh, about cops. There's not a lot of games about cops, so we, we wanted to bring that to people as well. Great. So um, I don't know if anyone has any specific questions for Jeff. We're going to start the stream in, in just a second here. But um, Well, the stream is going on. We're going to start playing in just a second here. We're at the beginning of the game. Uh, if you guys maybe want to ask Jeff anything, anything specific. Well, I was just going to ask you, Jeff, before we get too far in here, uh, this is kind of an old story, and I know you know the game's progressed a lot since since this story came around. But can you talk a little bit about the history of Sleeping Dogs as uh, you know, uh, sort of as it was originally worked on, and then what it's become now? I mean, I think I think it's pretty well known at this point that it originally was the true the true crime title, but has moved on a lot since then. So can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, so we actually started off, we, we weren't uh, the true crime. We actually started working with Activision on this way back in 2007. And, as its uh, own separate team. game, right? As its own separate game, which we, you know, we were thrilled about. And um, the design director, Mike Scupa, and Stephen Vandermesh, who's the executive producer, and myself, always um, tried to think of it that way and tried to uh, you know, um, keep it fresh. And Activision... Um, at some point early on in the game's development decided that they wanted to attach the True Crime brand to it, which we uh, weren't thrilled about, uh, but, um, you know, we, we were True Crime for a while, and uh, to, be, to be honest uh, with you, as I've talked with Ludwig about before, we were um, devastated by being canceled, but I think it was a blessing in disguise. We were... I'm happy to get rid of that brand, and we love working with Square. They've been awesome, and they've let us let us really finish this thing as we as we started it as an original IP. So, um, yeah, it's been a it's been a quite a development, um, almost five years, and uh, it, but you know we feel really fortunate. So many games that do get canceled um, if they see the light of day, um, which most of them don't. They don't uh, come to market with the kind of support um, that Square has put behind this game. So, uh, as I said, we're, we're happy, we're confident in the game, and we just think Square has done an amazing job with it. Yeah, I, I know that you have a really complex, interesting fighting system in the game, and I'm sure we'll see that and we'll talk about it in the stream here. 
But I wanted to ask you too, coming at just you know, just as background, coming away from the true crime idea and sort of the history of this particular title, yeah. are there things you think you were able to really like deep dive in on that maybe you wouldn't have if you had been slotted into the true crime series? Like, are there are there elements of the game you think you guys were able to build out because you didn't have to follow that sort of template? Yeah, there are for sure. I think uh, just to touch on a few of these, um, if you guys want me to go into more detail on any of them, I'm happy to. But you know, first thing. I think that we were able to tell more of a story that we wanted, to, more of the story that we wanted to tell, um, mm -hmm. which is uh, it, it's it's a crime story that's sort of big and sprawling and is a bit like an Elmore Leonard novel where characters come and characters go, and it doesn't really fit the the uh, what people might be used to in sort of a two-hour movie. So um, it, it's a bit harder to wrap your head around, but and Square, you know, let us let us do that, which I think has benefited the game. It works really well for an open world game to have a, a long and engrossing um, narrative with lots of different characters. Um, and I think from a mechanic standpoint, uh, yes, we were able to polish up the fighting to a level that we really feel uh, stands, stands well against just um, dedicated fighting games, uh, dedicated third-person action games in terms of the shooting and the driving. Um, that, that also got polished up. And you know, some things that we really spent time on um, since we started working with Square that really weren't necessarily in the game with Activision, um, the upgrade system uh, was a, uh, something we really invested heavily in. We've got our comp points, which uh, was, represent one upgrade path, or triad points, which represent another upgrade path, yeah. and the melee, the melee statues, and the face points, each with their own upgrade path. So that, that system has really been um, built out since starting to work with Square. We feel that that's unique. Um, yeah, I definitely want to talk about talk about that fighting system and how the different moves work. Um, yeah. When Probably when we get to that on the stream. I do want to say before we go too much further, we're getting a lot of people jumping in on the stream. If you're watching live and you're in the chat there, feel free to ask any questions and we'll pull them up and give them to Jeff here. He'll be able to answer them for you. So if you have questions about what you're seeing on screen or what's going on in the game or what, what you think about Sleeping Dogs, which is coming next week, uh, go ahead and ask him in the chat, and we'll send him over to Jeff here. So, uh, right now, you know, we're looking at uh, a lot of the open world stuff. Talk a little bit about, you know, what your philosophy was when you guys sort of um, approached an, an open world game. I mean, obviously, it was open world from the beginning, but open world games that we've played a lot of them at this point, and some of them have taken on different types of uh, settings and yeah. different things like that. T talk about, I guess, Hong Kong, right? Yeah, I think there's probably two sides to, to the answer to this question. The first side is um, it, it, we wanted to have a balance with this game. Even though we, we have really deep mechanics and we have really detailed uh, main missions where you can show these things off, we didn't want to forget it at its heart. It is an open world game. There have been some open world games that have come out recently where the open world isn't that fleshed out. Um, so we, we wanted to make sure that that balance of sandbox fun was there too, just stuff to mess around and do in the open world. So there's, there's several hundred things to do in the game. I think there's between three and 400 different missions, including all the collectibles and cases and jobs and stuff. So there's just a ton of stuff to do. That was really important to us to have that balance. And then the second part that I mentioned is, you know, Hong Kong. And it's, it's a unique um, city. It has enough familiarity that it won't be completely foreign to um, gamers in North America and Europe, but yet at the same time it has all these, these sorts of things that we're not used to seeing. It has, you know, the, the really, um, uh, the history, the city is, uh, and the Chinese history, the elements of mysticism, um, the language of course being different, Cantonese being predominantly spoken, we, we've got a lot of um, characters who speak Cantonese in the game. The food that's eaten, um, the, the layout of the city, uh, the architecture of the city with sort of the guts of the buildings are on the outside of them, the air conditioning and pipes and wires and all that sort of stuff. Um, and the kind of activities that you can do in the, uh, in the open world there, you know, um, singing karaoke, cockfighting, mahjong gambling. I was going to say, uh, we've got a question from Jay Smith, uh, 2144, who wants to see how mahjong poker works. Is that a, you can just go to a parlor or how does that work? Yeah, there's uh, Hong Kong, in, in the real Hong Kong, gambling is legal except for horse racing. So in the game, we've got two offshore gambling dens, which are unlocked through progression. And uh, once you get out to these gambling dens, yeah, you sit down and uh, can game away. Uh, it's, it's not a completely uh, detailed Mahjong game. That would be a game in itself. But um, yeah, we've got a, our version of that. 
And I guess because it's gambling, you can actually earn in-game money from it? Yes, exactly. Great. And use that to buy clothes, cars, massages, Great. whatever you want. Letty, you can jump in if you got something. I'm seeing that we're seeing some hand-to-hand -hand combat here finally, and I really want to talk a lot about this system that you guys have put together. A lot of open-world fighting, the, the extent of the hand-to-hand -hand combat system is a punch button. But yeah. Sleeping Dogs, you guys have really built out something interesting. So talk about sort of the foundation of what you wanted to do with this hand-to-hand -hand combat system and how it sort of evolved as you implemented it. Sure. Well, I have to give you know credit where credit is due, and that a lot of that um, comes from our design director Mike Scupa, who uh, is uh, ex of Bully uh, Rockstar's. Uh, mm. You know, their very very successful game, um, the Nevada's core fighting game as well. So. When, when Mike came aboard at UFG, which is really from day one on, um, on uh, Sleeping Dogs, way back in 2007, you know, he knew the kind of game he wanted to make, and he knew that, you know, the things he wanted to improve upon um, from Bully. So that, that's really the genesis of where it started. And, and Mike is a huge Hong Kong film fan, and um, the, the reference video that he showed all of us and said, this is what I want to make, was actually from the Tony Jaw film, The Protector, it's a scene where Tony Ja fights his way up uh, uh, the inside of a, a spiral building. You know, oh, yeah. Anybody can see it. And it's, it's like if you Google Tony Ja staircase fight, it's all one take. It's classic. There, yeah. are no, there are no camera cuts, and it actually feels like an open-world game. The camera is behind him for most of it in a third-person view. And the cool thing about this fight is that he's not just punching guys and kicking them. But he's doing two other things as well, and these two things he wanted to put into the game. One, he's actually using the environment. Um, he's throwing guys over railings. He's putting them into walls. He's banging their heads off tables. Uh, but the other thing is he's actually doing other things. He's kind of using things as props. He's like rips a sink off the wall and hits a guy with it. He kind of uh, turns the environment itself against um, his, his enemies. So those are the things you wanted to do in the game, was really give you not just punches and kicks, but let you use um, the environment um, in, in kind of all its forms as well. And, that, and that's it's, where the inspiration came from. It's funny because playing the game, I, the thing I most equated to actually was Arkham, Arkham City, Arkham Asylum. Like, it's very counter-driven. It, it seems like it's, it's sort of, uh, there's a lot of different moves, even though, you know, even though you're doing the same move, it's very context-sensitive, and, and it's very interesting how deep it gets. And then you also have this upgrade system where you can actually collect new moves, right, by going and yeah. training. Yes, exactly. You know, and, and we, we really loved um, Arkham, and both of those games are, are incredible. And, uh, you know, we chance to work with Square, who, you know, was heavily involved, uh, were heavily involved in Arkham Asylum, really helped us, I think, take the combat to a nice level of polish. And yes, as you mentioned, the, the counters are in there where you can perform any kind of um, counter. The enemies will glow red the moment that they're uh, about to perform a counterable attack. And um, yeah, so we're, as, as I said, big, big fans of that game. And I think it has influenced us. Um, Arkham, uh, I think, you know, Batman, the way he moves in that game, his cape covers up a lot of his movement. We don't have that luxury way is uh, not wearing a cape at any point. So we've spent a lot of time trying to tune the animation to make it look particularly smooth because we don't have that cape to cover up uh, him sliding or, or popping. I definitely want to talk more about the fighting system, uh, but people in the chat channel are asking about customization. Someone says, it was said, uh, Light, Light Arrow says, it was said in the live stream that there are 300, 400 clothing items. Is this true? And then maybe talk about, too, like the elements that you can customize and maybe what different pieces may do for you, may or may not do for you. Sure. Um, so yeah, there are uh, there's over 300 uh, different clothing items. Um, there's everything from kind of jeans and t-shirts to suits, and then beyond that, kind of goofy outfits, and then Hong Kong cinema inspired outfits and outfits inspired by things Bruce Lee has worn, um, Gordon Liu, Tony Jaa, kind of the icons of Hong Kong cinema. So yes, absolutely, that that's in there. Uh, as far as the where the clothing customization works, some of those clothing sets or, or, or clothing items can be combined into sets that give you bonuses. There's a thug bonus, um, for example, that I think gives you a discount on um, food bought. I can't exactly remember, but in any case, combining some of the clothing items will actually give you a, a buff in-game, a damage bonus. Uh, uh, purchasable items are, are less expensive, that sort of thing. So it's not all just customization. You're actually building some of your stats depending on what you wear. 
Exactly, exactly. And you, you can save those outfits as preset outfits in your wardrobe. Go into your wardrobe and change those. So your wardrobe is accessed in any one of your four safe houses. Uh, and you, uh, you can buy new clothes at clothing stores all around Hong Kong. And each clothing store has a different um, selection of clothes depending on what part of town they're in. Um, Central Hong Kong is more suits. Uh, whereas North Point, where you start the game, it's more streetwear. Cool. We're seeing a little bit of the fighting in this in the game now. It's it, it talk a little bit about. We also saw the cop and the triad experience pop up. So as you're fighting, you can actually earn new moves and build out his uh, uh, his his move pool. Exactly. How does the the upgrade work? I mean, you need to earn the two sets of experience, and then what do the two sets of experience give to you? Sure. It's it's really straightforward and easy. So. Um, the cop experience, the way that works is uh, during a mission, uh, you, you will lose cop points as you go through a mission, depending upon if you damage public property, if you hurt innocents, if you hurt, hurt cops, your cop points will go down. Um, and what the cop points, if you're successful and you actually finish mission with a lot of cop points, that will like upgrade your driving uh, and your shooting skills predominantly. The triad points, those go up through a mission as you fight or as you free run successfully, uh, in, in any of our chases, or your shooting is awesome, uh, your shooting and driving, the cop, your, your tribe points rather will go up. And that allows you to get bonus modifiers or uh, damage modifiers on certain moves, uh, makes um, certain moves more lethal. It's, that's more about fighting and weapon use. And then the other aspect of um, customization, uh, character customization, is finding melee statues. Around the world there are a dozen uh, melee statues, all uh, I idols from the, the Chinese zodiac, and as Wei returns these to his uh, Sifu at the, the the martial arts gym, these unlock new move upgrades. Okay, cool. Um, Osborne in the chat channel has a very specific question, but uh, he really wants it answered, so we'll ask. In the true in the in the true crime build of Sleeping Dogs, where I guess uh, Sleeping Dogs a while ago. Uh, Wei would have to wear special riot gear and save hostages. Is this activity still in Sleeping Dogs? Has the game changed a lot, you know, too much since you've been working on it originally, or does he still have sort of cop missions to pull off and things like that? There are totally still cop missions in the game. Uh, those are uh, cases. Um, there are four cases in the game, uh, four parts to each case. We call those leads. So these are more cop themed. Um, things that Wei does for one of the characters in the game and they really kind of help him clear his conscience or balance uh, doing some good detective work with some of the terrible stuff he has to do undercover and these are more investigative so you know instead of uh, driving or shooting or fighting you might be doing some following or some photography or some evidence gathering so it's a bit of a change of pace um, we definitely do mix in the action there but it's you're doing more cop stuff lock picking um, hacking, that kind of thing. Um, as far as the um, uh, hostage um, stuff goes, um, that uh, um, the question is all about, yes, I, I, I would love to be able to talk about yeah. um, stuff that's coming down the road, or potentially coming down the road from us, but um, let's just say that that might find its way in there. Yeah, you don't want to spoil it, that's for sure. Ocean Swimmer wants to know, can you, tri can you buy and train pet dogs? <laughs> Uh, no, no. All but, the dogs um, are sleeping. It's only sleeping dogs in this game. All the dogs are sleeping. I think you can buy a bird for one of your safe houses, but I don't think you can buy any dogs. Cool. We answered this just a little bit, but uh, Poker360 wants to know, were there any specific games that inspired the development of Sleeping Dogs? It sounds like it was very inspired by Hong Kong movies, and you talked a little bit about how Arkham had inspired the combat, but are there, are there open world games that you guys really look to when you wanted to, to work on this, or, or non-open world games that you were looking at? Uh, you know, I think that there was no um, game or, or group of games in particular that um, we kind of looked at and said we want to be like these guys. I think the, the great thing about United Front Games um, is that we assembled a team of guys who you know, almost all of them had worked on open world titles. We've got a bunch of guys from Electronic Arts who worked on Need for Speed, on Skate, on Godfather, um, guys who worked on Mercenaries, guys from Radical who worked on Scarface and Hulk and Prototype. Um, I mentioned Bully and other guys from Rockstar. So, you know, we, 
we have a very experienced crew, and I think what that enabled us to do was, you know, I talked about starting this as an original IP. When everybody kind of put their collective brain power and, and skills together, um, we felt we could create something special, and we didn't really have to look to something else and say we want to be like that, but certainly everybody was able to kind of leverage their skills from those other games and bring them into this one. I think a perfect example is with the driving. Um, a lot of the guys from Need for Speed early on said, listen, we want to have a driving system that's easy to pick up and play, that feels fun and arcadey and not simmy and slidey, and, and uh, I, I think we've achieved that. So that, that's just an example of um, something that inspired us, but more indirectly. Cool. A couple people in the chat channel have asked uh, about mods for PC. Is that a possibility, or is that something that you're planning to do? Um, I can't really talk about that right now, but uh, there will be some information coming on um, very, very shortly about that. Okay, so stay tuned if you're interested in modding the game for PC. And then uh, we have another question from MSI Zeal, who wants to know about vehicle customization. He saw that you can store videos in a different store vehicles in a different video, but can you modify them as well? Is that something that made it into the driving system, or is it essentially the cars that you have in the game? Yeah, the, the modification that we have for the vehicles is paint jobs, which is uh, a byproduct of. Our lead vehicle artist, a guy by the name of Neil Ambler, and Neil was uh, part of the Need for Speed team for a long time. So he's uh, modeled all the vehicles, but uh, he's also created some pretty cool custom paint jobs and decals for these vehicles. So in each one of the parking garages, you can store as many vehicles as you buy or as you uh, gain from missions. And in each, uh, for each of these vehicles, they each have a number of preset paint jobs or decal jobs. So you can switch between those as you take your car out of the parking lot. Cool. Uh, we're seeing a little bit of the cutscenes here. Can you talk about the actors that you've got on tap and sort of how they were included in the game? Sure. Uh, you know, I, I Jeff, before, the, sorry, ahead, before Jeff. Uh, you do that, I'm going to just jump ahead so people can see some of the gunplay stuff. And uh, we are purposely skipping a lot of the cutscenes just so we don't spoil the story for people, just let everyone know. So I'm going to jump ahead a little bit into the game where we'll actually get to drive some cars and fire some guns. Sweet. Sounds good. Um, but just on the, on the cast, though, I, I think that, you know, we had our cast announcement a couple of weeks ago, our full cast announcements, where we kind of revealed that uh, we've got a, a lot of you know, both Hong Kong actors, people like James Hong and Edison Chan and Robin Chu and Shin Han, but uh, also in a great um, cast from, from Hollywood. Tom Wilkinson, Lucy Liu, Will Young Lee, who plays Wei, Emma Stone, Lin Yunjin Kim from Lost. Uh, and the amazing thing for us was when you know, we put together our wish list of actors to play these roles, who were kind of all written a little bit, at least with some of these actors in mind, and we heard back uh, that, that these actors were you know, willing to, to work with us. I mean, that's... that's best case scenario kind of dream come true and I have to say each and every one of them was amazing to work with and I uh, hope we get a chance to work with them again. Um, Will in particular who plays Wei um, I think did an incredible job with a very difficult part. He has to be a tough guy most of the time but at the same time as a gamer you have to sympathize and identify with him both because you're, you are him and also because you know he's been to cover cops so you have to see his vulnerability. He can't be just sort of a, a badass Charles Bronson type all the time. So Will um, just did an amazing job with Way. Um, we have a couple questions in the chat channel actually about the Team Fortress 2 tie-in. And Cock, I apologize for this in advance. He says, "Oh, cool! This is the mini game that came with my new TF2 hat, which is kind of, kind of mean, but it's funny." I thought. Uh, what? How did that come about? The Team Fortress 2 hats, the the trade-off. Did were you guys in, involved in that, or was it just something that uh, Square Enix put together with you all? Yeah, that was a marketing team thing, Dave. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Well, we're looking we're looking a little bit forward now. Um, David Jans wants to know: Do the choices you make between cops and triads affect the gameplay? Of course, as you you said, as you do different. Um, do different things in the game, you earn experience for either cops or triads, and then those unlock certain abilities, right? Yes, and I'm just noticing, uh, looking at the live stream, um, that you guys are, have the Rico outfit on, which we, we're really um, stoked about. The outfit looks great. Um, but as far as the, the cop and the triad um, storyline, yeah, th there's not a branching storyline. Um, the storyline is uh, linear. 
uh, and we, we had a certain story in mind that we wanted to tell, so we, we, we stuck with that. However, the COP and the Triad upgrades, um, you're scored on those at the end of each mission. And if you're not happy with your score, you can immediately go back and replay that mission with our, our replay feature and, and have a chance to, to change your scores. So if you do get to a certain point in the game and you want to go back and sort of give, give another upgrade path a try, you certainly can. But at the same time, you can also just do more of uh, certain kind of missions which will give you, let's say, more cop points. So you don't have to go back and replay if you want to. You can just play a certain type of content to get that, that upgrade path fulfilled. Cool. cool. Um, how big is the map, Joe Chan34 wants to know? Um, you know, I, I was asked a, a similar question yesterday, and I don't have the exact number of square kilometers, um, but it's big. And the, I think really comparable with other games that are out there. The other thing um, that I always like to mention when talking about the map is one of the things we've done differently than a lot of um, other open world games and in urban open world games in particular is we've got several dozen um, very, very detailed uh, interiors. And I, I, calling them detailed isn't really doing them justice. These are custom levels uh, like you would see in a linear game. We've got these set in uh, manufacturing plants, which I think we're going to take a look at. We've got these set in skyscrapers, um, bars, all different kinds of places where we set up both combat props and custom encounters. So it, from that point of view, you know, it, you're getting a level of um, detail in it, uh, that you normally don't see in open world games. The other thing is we've got um, other aspects of the island itself. We've got uh, the peak, which is a mountain uh, in the middle of Hong Kong with a roadway. Uh, winding up there that is a great spot for a lot of our races. We've got boat gameplay, and we've also got different levels, uh, or I guess I should say um, uh, levels of height around Hong Kong. Uh, staircases that go up onto low rooftops. Uh, you can have chases across pedestrian bridges, and yes, if you do encounter a guy up there and you want to throw up the pedestrian bridge onto the road below, you can. So there's, um, th there's some, some height uh, elevation in there as well. Yeah, and it's it, uh, the the part that I played was kind of in the middle of Hong Kong, and it it just seems very detailed. Like even you know, even though the area that specific area, I didn't get to see the mountain or get get on a boat, but even though that specific area was relatively small, it was so populated and it's very dense down there, especially so. Well, you know, thank you. We uh, we we wanted to make it feel like the real Hong Kong, where you, you know, there's uh, there is that feeling of density, pedestrian density, and kind of objects density. Yeah. Um, but but also, we spent a lot of time. And I mentioned this at the beginning, working on gameplay density and making it it feel to the gamer like you can't really go 20 or 30 seconds without sort of encountering something to do, um, especially as you get later on in the game and have unlocked everything. Um, th there's really a ton to do around the game. Yeah, we're looking at more of the combat in the in the stream right now. And again, we've talked before about this combat system, but this is probably worth harping on a little bit because, like I said, a lot of open world games don't really jump into the combat, and you guys went real deep on the combat system. Uh, now, when you when you level up and when you sort of get new moves for the combat, are you looking at eventually unlocking everything, or is it or is it uh, sort of a, a path type of customization. Do you choose the type of path that you take, or are you just looking at eventually unlocking all the moves in the game? I mean, we, we want you to unlock everything. Okay. Um, the way that the, the way that the, the upgrade system works is you won't find yourself having gone down one path and then not being able to go back or not having enough time to go back and unlock everything else. Um, yes, you know, th there's definite sort of uh, streams, but the way the game works out. Um, most most players will be able to upgrade to to everything we we have there for them um, by the time they finish the game. Cool. Cool. Yeah, um, including a really a really cool dim mock death touch move that was sort of Bruce Lee inspired, um, which I think looks amazing and is one of the the, the last combat upgrades. Nice. Uh, um, a couple Jeff, people. Uh, sorry, Mike. To go on, Jeff. Uh, yeah, go just, on. Um, we, we, we've been watching some of these uh, environmental sort of uh, attacks, executions, um, and uh, I just saw someone throw a guy into a furnace. Do you, yeah. did you have sort of internal discussions about when it was crossing the line, when something was just too violent, or, or did you just sort of go with whatever seemed fun? Uh, that's a tough question, Ludwig. I think we, uh, you know, we, we did talk about these a lot, and I think... Uh, 
Only a few of them probably got turned down. I, I wish I could remember um, what what they were. Um, they were particularly awful. Um, <laughs> but but um, the funny thing is, you said awesome think, or awful. <laughs> <laughs> well, they they were awful and awesome. Um, but I think in um, trying to maintain some level of um, you know, way our character not not becoming uh, you know something out of a horror movie. We we, we pulled it back. So um, yeah, all, all the items that are in here, we, we try to relate them to the environment that he's in. There's a mission right now. You guys are in a manufacturing plant, so there's like a furnace and um, electrical outlets and boxes full of sharp things and that sort of stuff. Um, propane tanks, but um, in in other areas it might be a fish processing plant. You know, uh, everything from hooks to you know big buckets of dangerous fish so um, yeah everything tried to be thematic and, and some of the worst props we tried to keep to later in the game when Wei has, has kind of gone in really really over his head and, and is a bit mm-hmm. adrift um, th- those are the times when I think he feels most lost in a story that um, you, you'll probably use some of the most vicious combat props and uh, just to stick to sort of another philosophical type question uh, a lot of these open world games they kind of uh, they find themselves choosing between devoting development time and resources to sort of the world, or some of them may focus more on driving mechanics. And uh, Sleeping Dog seems to be really rounded in terms of having all these different systems really well developed. I mean, how did you sort of uh, you know go about developing the game in order to sort of give almost equal devotion to all these things when most development teams don't seem to do that? Uh, the the honest answer uh, is an incredible lack of sleep. <laughs> um, the um, you know when we started making this game, um, we wanted to spend a tremendous amount of time on the action mechanics, which meant that we had to have missions that supported those, and that facilitates the need for very very detailed mission scripting, very very uh, detailed AI, um, and and detailed environments, and th- that in itself. Um, it felt like a linear game at times. It's a tremendous amount of planning and precision that, as you kind of alluded to, you normally don't see in an open world game. But at the same time, we wanted this thing, as I said earlier on, to be a sandbox. And we never wanted to forget that at some level, it, it should feel like a toy that you can just kind of pick up and roam around the world and have fun with the crazy stuff that happens. And that was a, it was a hard balance. And I think um, one of the reasons why um, we were able to, I think, be successful in doing that is we have a very experienced team that I mentioned before, uh, guys who've made lots and lots of more games, but also just an incredibly hard-working team. These guys just um, would not, uh, you know, they would not go home. There were so many late nights, guys uh, sleeping in the studio, guys working really hard, and, and the great thing was, um, from, from my position as um, a senior producer, they wanted it, and they, they wanted it especially after the cancellation. These guys wanted to prove what the team could do and that the vision for the game um, was, was solid and sound. And uh, that was just, I think, something that uh, yeah, the, the whole team was behind and motivated to do. A couple people in the chat channel are asking about difficulty levels. Are there different levels of difficulty to play through or, or basically one experience? It's, it's basically one experience, yeah. Uh, that makes so, sense. There is uh, more and more difficult enemies that uh, Wei will face as he goes through the game, um, including mini-bosses that are more difficult. Um, He faces guys who don't just have uh, fists and martial arts skills, but who have melee weapons, who have different um, uh, guns. So yeah, there's definitely a scaling difficulty in the uh, the gameplay itself, but no, there's not gameplay levels, uh, or sorry, difficulty levels. Cool. We're seeing more of the context-sensitive uh, combat that Luddy is uh, offended by. Just kidding. I'm not offended by it. Oh, <laughs> someone's asking if there's any swimming in the game. That's a good question. Um, there, there is swimming, yep. Um, Wake Way can swim. He doesn't die if he hits the water or anything like that. And he, uh, there's boat gameplay as well. So one of the things that is kind of cool is that there are these big sewage sort of outflow outlets in the game or, or underground sort of caverns and uh, once you've found these things uh, there's usually some kind of criminal activity into those so 
Wei can either go in there in a boat or he can swim in there and um, there's there's a bunch of guys there waiting for him with, with some kind of um, combat. Uh, here's a question from uh, Dave, David Jans is in the chat channel and he wants to know what inspired you guys to do this story in China? This originally, like we talked about before, it was uh, at one point thinking about being a true crime type of game, but it actually was created before that and you had always chosen Hong Kong as the setting, right? Yeah, when we, uh, you know, started working with Activision back in 07, uh, they they were very um, disinclined to kind of tell us what they had in mind. They wanted us to kind of come up with something. And when uh, we came back and said, well, we're thinking Hong Kong, they actually said, well, that's good because we were thinking, um, you know, Asia, specifically Hong Kong as well. We were kind of hoping you'd say that. So mm. um, it, was, it was really fortuitous that that worked out. Their vision was quite divergent from our vision at that time. Um, we envisioned something a lot more realistic, a lot uh, grittier, and, and based on the, the sources that I talked about, try election, infernal affairs, and you know even Western movies like um, uh, uh, The Departed and Eastern Promises, the David Cronenberg film. So um, they envisioned something a lot more fantastical, um, but um, we're glad that, again, we, we got back to um, our vision. Is it just that media that, that uh, drove you towards Hong Kong, or is there something specific about the setting that you guys really liked it and wanted to do? I think uh, it was the media, for sure, that played a big part of it, but also, you know, we, sitting down with uh, Mike and Steven and our, our, uh, our executive producer and our other leads early on, we wanted to do something in the open world genre that uh, really hadn't been done before, and that was to place an emphasis, emphasis on the action mechanics and specifically the fighting. And there's not too many cities in the world where you can have a uh, urban open world game where sort of melee fighting makes as much sense as it does in Hong Kong. You know, I, I, unless you wanted to have like a, a Walker Texas Ranger game, you know, or something like that, where Chuck Norris was kicking the guns out of people's hands. Uh, I don't know. It would be hard to do in a lot of cities in America um, or, or anywhere else in the world. I think. Um, you know, where guns are, are so prominent and prevalent. So it just, it, it made sense for a lot of reasons. The cop aspect, the, 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 the melee aspect, and just the uniqueness of the city itself and the fact it really hadn't been done before. Wait a minute, Chuck Norris game. Now I'm, now I'm kind of interested in that one. Uh, we haven't have mentioned that, I'm sorry. <laughs> just kidding. We have another uh, a question. I, I, I lost track of who asked it. I, oh, Travik asked it. He said, did the dev team visit parts of China during the creation cycle of the game for the atmosphere? Did you guys do research over there for this? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we did a ton of research. Uh, I spent about uh, a week and a half, two weeks in Hong Kong. Uh, executive producer spent about the same amount of time, as did the art director, uh, who actually spent uh, more than that. Uh, the art direction uh, team took 25,000 photographs, tons of video. The audio team went over there and just recorded everything from ambient street noise to sounds of, um, you know, gambling in sort of underground dens and uh, that kind of stuff. We had a writer spend time over there who spent time talking with, uh, we were very, very fortunate to have him be able to talk to uh, uh, members of the police force and ex-members of the police force as well. And I, I get people kind of... Um, uh, non, uh, not, not believing every time I say this, but uh, a writer did actually, through connections and a very long period of negotiation, manage to talk to some triad members, and he didn't meet them in a coffee shop or anything like that. This was a period where they, they met him after vetting him and sort of took him on about two days of, of touring around their sort of places of business. And um, so, yeah, we, we made every effort to watch the movies and read the books, but also go to Hong Kong and, and try to understand that city as best we could and, and bring those things to people in the game, both in terms of the, the main storyline and the characters who were in it, kind of were inspired by people we met and things we read, but also just the city itself and how uh, vibrant it is and what people wear and how they talk and how they act and what you can eat and the cars and all of that. We just wanted to put that in the game. And the music, you know, there's... Um, radio stations and all the cars and bikes and boats, canto pop and Chinese classical music is there as well. So there's a, there's a blend of stuff. So you're saying one of your team joined the mafia just to make this game? <laughs> well, uh, he, he was a, maybe an honorary member for a day or two. I, I wouldn't go <laughs> quite as far as. <laughs> uh, and and uh, yeah. 
We're seeing driving around the city now, and this is what I was talking about before, how how dense it is. It is very dense. Uh, I am As Zav is driving around, I'm seeing on the side pop up uh, little badges or little little challenges or stats. One, that's pop, one just popped up called Clean Drive. Can you talk about yeah. those? And I've seen those in Melee, too, where it's sort of counting your counters and doing things like that. Talk about that system. Sure. So one of the things we have that um, is sort of extending... Um, the life of the or, or the the gameplay beyond just the the life of the the single player is um, we have uh, the stat challenges and how they work as you're going through the game. A variety of stats are being recorded. Um, uh, actually, a ton of stats are being recorded. And some of these things you'll see pop up in the lower right hand corner. And uh, these are are logging your stats. Now you can actually uh, play this game uh, and and challenge your friends. Uh, in these stat challenges and all this stuff is posted up to leaderboards so whether it's clean drive or longest motorcycle wheelie or longest motorcycle jump or number of pork buns consumed um, you can challenge your friends in these things and it just um, it, it just is a, a, some of the stuff is fun and frivolous but again being an open world game we didn't want to lose sight of, of that aspect of um, what it enables you to do Cool. Yeah, it, 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 so it's sort of asynchronous multiplayer, even though, you know, just as you play the game, it'll track your different stats there. Exactly. Cool. Uh, a couple people have asked this. I, I don't think that we've heard anything about it. I don't know if there's anything coming. Is there any multiplayer, like real-time multiplayer? Um, we have, we've been talking about some stuff. Um, I, I don't want to talk about that yet. Sure, but, sure. Um, but we're, we're, there's some things we're, we're looking into. Um, definitely some challenge with challenges with a uh, multiplayer fighting, um, but uh, certain okay. aspects of the game, yeah, we're looking into it. Well, we'll look forward to any news about that in the future. Uh, a couple people have asked about guns, and I'm interested in, I did not I did not get a ton of chance to play with the gun system when, when I played around with the game. Does it is it an inventory system like, like Grand Theft Auto, or is it uh, like a slot system, or how does wielding guns, maybe gun customization work in the game? Well, we always envision guns as a power-up, which is kind of how you see guns being used in a lot of um, Hong Kong cinema films, unless, of course, you're John Woo, where, where everybody um, in John Woo films has guns. But uh, Unlimited ammo. You know, unlimited ammo, um, yeah. So the, you know, the way our, our gun system works is that way, yes, you can stow a pistol. Um, you can't stow a shotgun or an assault rifle in, in, in a bag of holding. Um, we wanted Wei to primarily rely on his martial arts skills and and that sort of pistol, making it more believable that he's an undercover cop. Now, um, later on and in the game, in particular, as you get past uh, the, the manufacturing plant mission, which we uh, we just saw, that's really where guns uh, become more and more prevalent in the story. Uh, in the real Hong Kong, guns are extremely rare. They're they're outlawed. Uh, there's you know laws against possessing a single bullet, but in the game. Once guns make an appearance, they do factor into gameplay more and more. It doesn't mean that um, uh, there still won't be some missions where you're fighting um, or, or mixing guns and fighting. Um, there, but uh, yeah, you'll see more and more of them into the second act of the game until finally in the, in later missions, uh, it's it's tons of gunplay, assault rifles, grenade launchers, rail shooters, uh, all kinds of stuff. So rail um, shooters. We yeah, we've got a lot of uh, rail shooters in the game where we, uh, you, we've got a, an amazing driving and shooting system. We spend a lot of time trying to make the driving and shooting feel better than any other urban open world game, but uh, Way goes along for the ride in a few instances, and actually uh, the rail shooters are some of the most exciting parts of oh, the game. Uh, I understand. I thought you made rail gun. I was like, there's rail guns in Hong Kong already? <laughs> uh, not yet. The technology they have. Not yet. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah, maybe in a sequel. We'll see. Uh, someone asked about the uh, language. Oh, uh, Molson Drinker wants to know, is there a Chinese language option in the North American release? How did you handle, handle languages? Because like you said, there's a lot of Cantonese, um, but the main character generally speaks English in the, the demo that I played. How did you guys sort of approach languages in, in such a international setting? Uh, well, Cantonese is the uh, main uh, language of, of Hong Kong. Um, English is not as... In our research, we sort of learned that English is not as prevalent as, as we actually thought. Um, uh, and, and Mandarin is also spoken there, but, but not nearly as, as, uh, as prominent as Cantonese. So uh, what we tried to do in the game was, of course, given it's for um, gamers in the West, we biased it towards English. However, 
we wanted to keep that authenticity. So many of our characters in cutscenes uh, uh, will speak in Cantonese, and their lines are subtitled. Uh, in fact, uh, Edison Chen, who uh, plays Jackie, Wei's sort of right-hand man, often mixes Cantonese and English in the same sentence, and we've subtitled that. Um, we, we have a, a subtitling system, so if you're annoyed and you don't want to see what those subtitles mean, yeah, you can definitely turn it off. Um, and then, of course, characters on the street will speak in uh, can with Cantonese accents or speak entirely in Cantonese. Um, we, we did want to bring that into the game. We thought it would be inauthentic to do otherwise. And I, I think one of the other things that we, we tried to do was do our recording in Hong Kong. So a lot of our uh, voice voices, especially ambient voices, were recorded in Hong Kong. Uh, a number of others were actually recorded in Vancouver, where our studio is based, which has a very, very large... Um, population of, of uh, native Hong Kong, uh, native Hong Kong uh, people, and uh, so they were amazing in coming in and speaking Cantonese and not having to go all the way to Hong Kong to record that. Cool. So it's time for one more question. Uh, Letty, I don't know if you want to jump in. We can talk a little bit more. I had a question about the dojos, but Letty, if you got something, go ahead. No, go ahead. It's fine. Uh, we're, we're, we're looking at the combat again, and we've talked before about how complex the combat can be. I know the dojo system is also fairly well built out. I think there's even a pre-order for George St. Pierre, so it's actually very MMA style. Talk about the different dojos that you find around the city, and then I think we're looking at like a pit gameplay right now, like where it's rounds. This is a very cool um, area you guys are right now. So uh, you found sort of an area behind it. I uh, question about the size of the world earlier. This is one of the alleys of Hong Kong, and it just uh, in the alley, there's a, a fight club going on. So Waze jumped into this fight club, and this is, I think, the second or third hardest fight club um, in the game. They get progressively, uh, or they're all, um, uh, they get progressively harder, and uh, I think it, and one of them way ends up finding like 25 guys or something like that. It's, it's awesome. So you definitely want to go there once you've got all the upgrades. Um, but the rewards in these fight clubs are really cool too. This is where you'll gain um, those, those, uh, some of those Hong Kong cinema-inspired outfits that I talked about that are more uh, the martial arts icons of cinema. And yeah, you know, we, we just, um, it's a, plan, a chance for you to go practice your skills and, um, and earn rewards as well. So this is different than the, the dojos you mentioned or the gym. There's one martial arts gym where Wei can go and redeem the uh, Zodiac statues that he finds, and mm -hmm. in so doing, gain those, those moves. And there's a nice little story thread with the guy who runs the, the dojo or the gym, who actually knows Wei and was his martial arts teacher as a, as a young man. So Wei's come back to Hong Kong, and this guy's dialogue with Wei is, is really interesting. He's probably the closest thing that Wei has to a father figure. Cool. Yeah, that's really neat. And, and it, like I said, it shows how much time you put into the fighting that it takes up such a, a big part of the gameplay. I think that's going to be a real big sort of selling point for this type of thing because we haven't seen this this kind of complex action open world game necessarily before. Well, you know, we wanted... Uh, the thing that's cool about Hong Kong cinema is that what these action heroes do, you know, they're fighting and they, they go over a table and they tackle a guy, they take his gun away and then they leap out a window shooting. And, and that kind of freedom works great in an open world if you can deliver the mechanics. So that's what we wanted to do in making this game was really enable people to experience deeper mechanics than they have before in the genre and be able to choreograph their own action sequences. So that's, um, that's what we've tried to create and we, we think we've done it and that people will, will enjoy that, that freedom and feeling like a, a Hong Kong action hero. Cool. Jeff, thanks so much for joining us. Jeff is a senior producer on Sleeping Dogs, which you're watching here live on the Joystick Stream. Thank you very much for joining us. Good luck. The game comes out next week, right? Next, uh, yeah, the 14th, next, next Tuesday. So thanks a lot, guys. I really appreciate the time. Thanks very much for coming on. My pleasure. Bye-bye. And uh, thanks, everyone, for watching the stream. We really appreciate your time. And uh, next week on the PlayStation 3, Xbox 360, and PC, Sleeping Dogs is coming out. This is the PC version. And uh, check out our review next week. Uh, I believe it's going to be on August 14th, which is the day that the game launches. So make sure to check out joystick.com. Thanks, everyone, for watching. We appreciate it.